know this business of styling, it's really had its peculiar times, like directly after the war, when we really got carried away. That old pendulum was swinging way out there. We slathered them with chrome. We had three different kinds of colors per car. Fishtails and, and fins. Fishtails and fins, the whole shot. Fortunately, I think that we're, we have that behind us. We have it out of our system. And we're actually having to settle down to do some very serious work now. The government is trying to find out just what we can do to make a car safe. A lot of people were very pessimistic whether we could design a good-looking car based on the requirements. You talk about the uh, people involved, thousands and thousands of man-hours, the expenditure of millions of dollars, uh, and all you're going to do is when you get through with it, somebody's going to crash it. Exactly right. There you go. At the design center of the Ford Motor Company, tomorrow's automobiles are already taking shape. They will be substantially different from today's, not so much because of designers' efforts to initiate changes in appearance, but because of the dictates of safety. To tell about this new era in automotive design, its effect on the men who design automobiles and on the automobiles themselves, reporter David Diles was invited to spend some time at Ford's Design Center. His first talk was with the director of safety design, David Wheeler. We as uh, viewers, readers, consumers, just, I guess, in the last couple of years, have become aware of the government's increased involvement with automotive safety. How extensive is that involvement right now? Well, so far, there's about a hundred different subjects that have been covered, both in advanced notices and in actual standards. And those notebooks in the back there cover uh, many of these, but there's about a hundred in all. And virtually every part of the car has had a standard written about it. For example, one is indirect visibility. Uh, and indirect visibility is what you see through your mirrors in your car and is your view to the rear through these devices. They brought out an initial notice, and our first problem was to see what it said. So we constructed this 25th scale model and uh, tried to see uh, in this form what the docket meant to us. For 1974, the government required that we saw three lanes of uh, behind the car, and we could see it with either one or two mirrors, or three if we wished, just like we have today. We actually built a car full size to show these requirements, and in order to get these requirements here, we had to raise the side glass here, we had to raise the back window, we had to in fact raise the whole roof of the car about six inches. We put a, a normal width rear viewing device inside, but the side mirror to pick up this edge of the target got to be about, about nine inches long, which in itself would be a safety hazard sticking out of the side of the car. They then said, in 1976, you've got to see, in fact, all five lanes of the traffic, and you can only do it with one viewing device. And they actually mentioned in the docket probably a periscope. We have made many mock-ups of periscopes. Um, we've built cars, we've built seating bucks with different kind of mirror systems in, and yet we haven't seen one that we're really satisfied with. Um, our problem is, you know, if you take forward vision, where does peripheral vision take over? And where does rear vision looking through mirrors take over? We'd like to come up with a complete stand. Because of this stress now on safety, because this must be done by 74, that must be done by 75. Does it alter your whole concept of your job? Are you so much a style designer now as you thought you were before? Well, I don't like your saying that I was before. Uh, because many people think of the automotive stylist, as he's called, and incidentally, this is called the design center instead of styling, uh, as a person who just did the outside, and that's not true. Uh, what we designed into the car, or tried to, was desirability. And 
And uh, this is both engineering and appearance uh, efforts to make this happen. A man doesn't care how things look in front of him if he's not comfortable in his seat. Or if we have dandy letters on the speedometer and you can't read what the numbers are, uh, we're not getting any place. I think that the, uh, the, the challenge is exactly that of trying to uh, package the functional components in a manner that, that are useful and attractive, and I think we've done it. You know, for instance, this panel is a far cry from one we had just a few years ago. I, I think that during the, well, the late, mid and late 50s especially, I think a lot of pretty horrible things were done in the name of uh, design and styling, you know, and I think if you compare some of those jukebox instrument panels with this functional layout that you have to agree that we've come a long way. One of the problems, uh, I guess it's more of a complaint than a problem, is serviceability, uh, getting something repaired. Uh, it's a very valid complaint, I think, and uh, oh, maybe 10 years ago, we were so busy trying to package all of these components in there, as I told you, that there wasn't adequate consideration given to having to get them out again. Uh, in many cases, I think we assumed that if we put in a light bulb for the uh, for the speedometer, say that it would last forever, which isn't true. So in the last few years, we've set up two things. One of them is reliability standards, so that we have to have the best possible equipment in there that will last as long as possible. And then in addition to that, we've set up serviceability standards, which take every single part, including the little bulb that lights the uh, speedometer, and we've established standards for that that says that we have to be able to get it out and replace it very quickly and easily. And uh, remarkably enough, we've been able to hit these standards right on the nose. And every year, we take on a little more task to try and better them. I don't know whether the government forced it down your throat or whether you did it on your own. No, the service and reliability was our own doing quite a while ago, as a matter of fact. When you get into the car that you drive to and from work, you can't be always happy with that car, can you? Oh, I usually don't like it very well. It's an old car. It's three years old when I get it new. It's That's difficult. because you've been working on the work years in advance? Beyond this, and I am quite dissatisfied with what we did at that time. I think that a designer is inherently dissatisfied with things the way they are. That's why he designs. He, he wants change. He doesn't accept the way it was done before. You're not concerned, then, that some of the uh, standards being set for you outside your industry are going to inhibit you as a creative person, as a designer? Well, they're problems. They're difficult. Some of them may be unrealistic, and we, we're negotiating back and forth constantly on these things. The um, restraining of the occupant in the vehicle, um, if you were going to ship an egg uh, from one point to another, would you put it in a box and at the other end of the box put an explosive device with a airbag or whatever you want to call it? Is this the best way to protect the egg from getting broken when you move it? This is really what we're doing with people. We're putting them in a container and we're moving this container. And the container has to be subject to violent maneuvers. How do you best package this person? So we're exploring. Two, one, fire. We think of cars primarily as running into a wall. But in this case, the car and the dummies are sitting in one place and it's suddenly driven backwards. It's a little hard for people sometimes to understand that the car is going backwards and it comes out the same as running into a wall. The Automotive Safety Research Center is one component of Ford's research and engineering complex. Here, dummies substitute for people in a variety of simulated crashes. One way of developing the engineering principles which set the guidelines for the work of designers. The device undergoing extensive testing is the airbag, an innovation which the industry has viewed with some skepticism. It's a rather dramatic device. You can, you can see how someone would be convinced that this is the ultimate piece of machinery. There's, there's two very simple problems. One is reliability of its operation. And if the airbag went off by accident, it would be rather shocked going down the road at 75 miles an hour. The other problem is that an airbag for a given size of person, a given weight, and a given circumstance can be designed to save his life. However, uh, the same airbag doesn't do for everybody. So it's not quite as simple as it sounds. We're working on it, and uh, we've uh, 
have expended a lot of money, a lot of energy, and a lot of thought on this subject. Uh, and we, we are definitely making progress with airbags, but they're still nowhere near anything that you'd want to put in your car. We're trying to do a second element that has to either ride in the pillar, I understand, go up to a D-ring and back down over the shoulder with the buckle element being hooked together with the seat element that when you pull it out, it goes over the passenger and locks up, of course, to the other end of the seat belt. I guess the problem is... Efforts are also underway to perfect a more familiar device, the seat belt. One promising avenue of development is an interlock system, which will not permit the car to start unless seat belts are worn. Many different approaches to seat belts themselves are also being explored. Well, it's quite large. What, what, what bothers us, I think, from the uh, design standpoint is the fact that it's, it's cumbersome, it's, it does its job, it's safe. Is there a possibility we could reduce the size of this so we could tuck this up into the roof rail and make a smaller element a la some of these over here? This particular reel is designed to accommodate some 44 inches of webbing. We now oh, have determined we don't need quite that much. We need about 27 inches, so there are studies being undertaken to try to miniaturize that. Plus the fact you can make the webbing do more work for you, the shorter the webbing. If it's uh, excessively long like the others, it's extremely difficult to get the performance you want. The shorter the webbing, the more work you can get out of it. Is that fair, though, to, to force a man to wear a seatbelt or a safety harness to say you must wear it? What well, if the man doesn't want to? Isn't that a violation of his constitutional rights? At one time, this was a, a serious question. If you remember, there uh, was a case in Michigan about wearing helmets when they rode a motorcycle. And they said that uh, a man, I guess, has the right to commit suicide if he wants to, or to be unsafe, uh, or to do things hazardous to his health. And there was uh, serious concern as to whether you could force someone uh, to wear a seatbelt. But the, uh, the benefits are so great and so obvious that really you, uh, uh, you simply can't give them up uh, because it's a little inconvenient for the driver. And if we can devise a means that will uh, make it easier for the average driver or passenger to wear those in his car and uh, perhaps even uh, bug him a little bit to wear those things, I think uh, it would be to everyone's advantage. And actually, sometimes the safety standards, uh, for all practical purposes, are meant to do the job. But then again, we're dealing with human beings, and our job is to make the human being comfort, uh, comfortable with the safety standard. And this is the real bugaboo here, because eventually a human being has to buckle this all together in a three-point system and feel that he's safe and is safe and will wear it. This is the problem. Americans, I don't feel, want to be restricted. We have this problem, freedom of travel, freedom of moving around, uh, and to lock a person up. And this is literally what you have to do to make him safe. If you don't, he will flop around inside the cars and do the things that our pictures and crash tests show. So you have to confine him. And he doesn't want to be confined. So how do you do this diplomatically, comfort-wise, appearance-wise, make it desirable? And this is, this is real tough. I wanted to get to back on that door. We uh, spent time trying to get as much uh, character into the lower part of the door to give it a little faster. Uh, this is the experimental safety studio, Dave. Rather than being concerned with, uh, with the production end of it, that is, meeting the uh, latest standards, here we're concerned about getting these things into advanced cars and approaching the problem uh, very early in the game so that there's an opportunity for us to, to think about the thing before we have to build one. One of our more serious problems is uh, keeping down the massiveness of the areas on the inside of this car. Everything is massive. The doors are massive. The instrument panel is massive. It takes up a lot of space. It takes away the environment of the occupants sitting inside the car. And that's been one of the, the main complaints about uh, safety vehicles. We don't want to be called Sherman tanks, and uh, we're doing our best to avoid that. Doesn't this open up a whole new can of worms for you as a designer, though? You mentioned the challenge before. Uh... Yes, and, and frankly, I, I enjoy this type of work more uh, than being just a stylist. I think our job is not to be the, uh, the flamboyant uh, uh, sketch artist and uh, do it uh, hell or high water. 
because we like it that way. It, it just isn't going to be that way anymore. As in the case of this vehicle, uh, the engineers say this is the way it has to be, hell or high water. And uh, the challenge is for us to make it work. The vehicle under discussion is the experimental safety vehicle. The ESV, as it's called, is being built under contract with the federal government for one dollar. The objective is to develop an automobile that can suffer a 50 mile an hour crash and still have its occupants survive. The ESV will also serve as a test bed of new safety ideas, some of which, hopefully, will be ultimately incorporated in the cars we buy. We've made a great effort to try to make this car look as much like a normal production car as we can, and specifically not to have it look like a, a, a freak or an experimental sort of a thing. Uh, with the long overhangs, it, it is uh, obvious that it's a different kind of a car, but uh, we've worked very hard at, at trying to make it look usual. As might be expected, the experimental safety vehicle begins not with a designer's dream but with engineering concepts, which determine almost everything about the car except how it will look. And although the finished safety vehicle will appear usual, it is far from usual from the point of view of the engineers who have been developing it. The time that it takes to stop you down to no more speed. And we came up with a solution that we explained this morning already, which is semi-collapsible extensions to canvas and hood, which will then partially yield and come back after impact. This is made of very high strength steel. When it goes into the pole, it deflects, but it does not break or bend permanently. It's an enormously strong member. Each engineering innovation for the ESV is tested in a 50 mile an hour crash. So then mount it on the safe frame with your speed and make up a complete crash car. Of course, fenders will be added, the hood will be added. Obviously, this structure has something to do with our energy absorption again. As this thing impacts, it collapses to a very compact member. The force is transferred through those reinforcements against the firewall and its reinforced structure. I see the point you're making. You had the accordion effect over there, the, the accordion effect here. But why is all this necessary? Why can't you design something that's just sturdy enough or strong enough just to resist the crash, rather than having it absorb the energy? That's a very, very good question. In order to arrive at any livable and survivable deceleration for the car, it takes time. In other words, the more distance you have, like today, if you have to stop in front of another car, the more distance you have, the much more easily can you decelerate your car. Could I compare it to putting on one's brakes? Putting them on like that, you're going to thrust. Right. You put them on slowly, you can decelerate, as you say. That is exactly Same the principle. point. Yes. And for comparison, if you ever have a panic stop to make, you know what it means, how you feel being thrust right. forward. The deceleration we are after here is 40 times that high and considered a survivable condition. Further down here, of course, we do not want any crushing to take place. This is the living room for the passengers and drivers. This has to stay intact from all sort of crashes, sideways, rollover, front and rear. The bumper is really now the low transfer mechanism to affect the stopping of the car at this predicted rate. One of the most rigorous tests for the safety vehicle is a 50 mile an hour crash into a steel pole. Does its part in stopping the car by wrapping itself around the bumper and pulling the whole body inside. Any deformation is absorbed energy. These cars do look like a disaster, but they look like a minimized disaster, and that's what we're doing. Uh, it's still a disaster when somebody hits a pole, but we're making it a little less. Someone mentioned this morning that we may not have enough space for registers for the last layout. Does this appear that way? I can't see any differentiation. This one. It's just on the left here. Uh, when, you, when the pad slopes down over yeah. the top of this register, the airbag's right in here. 
and there's not enough room for register and connection and the airbag and the top stick. This is a, a task force of people from all over the uh, corporation who are involved in one way or another with a car. Uh, we have a man from body engineering who is responsible for the structures. Uh, we have another man who specializes in the column, the collapsible column, and how that is to be used. Can't be simply moving the opening. Uh, for the air conditioning down a couple of inches, gets into the heater controls. Those have to move someplace else. That in turn conflicts with something else, and, and we have a, a whole chain of events. All of the pieces that go in here, uh, somebody has to work out where that piece goes, if it conflicts with another piece or, or some other portion of the structure. And this gets to be a serious problem. It actually takes, in some cases, longer to do an instrument panel than it does the entire car. And that's because there's so many things in there all crammed together. So the problem is coming more and more complex and, and more difficult every year. But there is more enthusiasm among your people in here for this project because it is so demanding and uh, puts such pressure on them, I would think. I think that's true, and also because it gives us an opportunity to do different things. Uh, maybe uh, we wouldn't have allowed putting a, an instrument in a given place, but because there's no other place for it, uh, now it's acceptable. Many of these safety things, because they force you to change uh, how you would think about doing a car, may actually provide an opportunity to get a completely new and different look just because the rules have changed. The lessons to be learned from the ESV are for the future. Of more immediate concern are government regulations affecting the production cars of today. For most 1973 cars, front bumpers must be able to withstand impacts of five miles an hour with virtually no damage, an apparently modest innovation with some large consequences. Our bumper on the 72 Torino is a good example. It is uh, fully integrated, styled with the body bumper. Uh, the effect was to get a, the look of the European sporty car. In fact, the bumper here, because of the high styling, is almost lost. Isn't it it uh, functions more as a decorative than as a totally functional part. Why all this style change? Why didn't you come up with a bumper before that was uh, more functional and, and safer? Our buying public seemed to prefer the cars that uh, were prettier looking. And uh, as one company would move into a prettier looking car, then the next company would follow. Well, this car actually uh, gave you more problems, I guess, than any others because of the bumper situation. And you came up with a high style bumper. So how did the change evolve after the government sort of All right. came upon you? The, gov the government said, in 1973, we want you to meet a certain testing standard. And they specified the standard, and our structural engineers went to work on this problem, and they came back to tell us what they thought they needed in order to meet the requirement. Basically, it was to put a very thin or a very simple bumper section approximately here in front of the car. It had to be far enough out that it could absorb shock. It had to be relatively uh, plain in section vertically so that it could not override other bumpers. And we went through lots of sketches, as you can see on the hood. Well, this is one of them you uh, looked at and obviously uh, threw away, I guess. Yeah, we, we said we'd do, we'll put a parking light underneath the headlight, but we couldn't get enough height without changing a major portion of the structure of the front of the car. So this one didn't work, right? That, that didn't work. All right, this is the kind of thing that we then started zeroing in on. Let's, we said, let's take our headlights and we'll move them outboard. We'll take our parking lights and we'll move them out of the bumper into the grill. We'll have our very simple bumper. We'll primarily work with the style of our mouth and uh, what we can do in our fender ends. Just the bumpers changed that much about the total concept and appearance of the car, right? Yes. It, uh, I think it amounted to 108 pounds or so, the first bumpers, but also it got back into the suspension, into the, into the uh, tire size, it affected the weight of the car. Many things telegraphed themselves all the way through the automobile as a result of what happened up here in front. We went through a lot of 
trouble to finally get to what we see over here, I guess. And we sure did. It's the answer that we know that meets the requirement to our knowledge today and to the requirements that our engineering people think we should meet. Dave, with all the standards being set for you, and with the ideas that you have on your own here and all your people, what can we expect as consumers? What are we going to buy when we go into that showroom two, three years hence? Well, certainly you're going to have a safer car. There's no question of that. Uh, with the uh, uh, things that we've done to the interior of the car and the restraint systems, uh, you're going to be safer in an accident. You're going to have a car that will uh, uh, get less damage in a small accident uh, with the bumpers uh, fore and aft. Fewer repair bills then, maybe, or Hopefully, less, less yes. expensive repair yes. bills. Uh, but I think also uh, you're going to have a, a heavier car, perhaps a car that will cost a little more to operate, uh, take a little more gasoline, and it's going to cost you more initially in order to have these things. I, I think we're going to get into the next phase of this whole thing, which is interesting, and that's going to be the consumer reaction to what they've asked for. In other words, a consumer has, through his uh, congressman, if you will, uh, made some things happen. These, uh, after the lead time goes by, are going to show up in the street. And then the consumer is going to have to make the decision if this is indeed what he wants. Then the airbag was fixed, so we refolded it, and now it sticks out right where the register is.